From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Sunday morning session of the 186th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, second counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Our dear brothers and sisters, dear friends, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 186th semi-annual general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Thomas S. Monson, who presides at the conference, has asked that I conduct this session. We extend our greetings and blessings to those of you who are participating in these proceedings from all around the world, wherever you may be. The music for this session will be provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Mac Wilberg with Clay Christiansen and Richard Elliott at the organ. The choir opened this meeting with My Redeemer Lives and will now favor us with In Hymns of Praise. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Christoffel Golden of the Seventy.
Our beloved Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful to gather here under the direction of Thy Spirit. We are grateful for Thy plan of salvation, for Thy beloved Son, our saving Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are grateful for the Comforter, even the Holy Ghost, that Thou hast sent to be with us. We acknowledge Thy holy hand in all things. We are grateful for prophets, seers, and revelators, for the prophet Joseph Smith, who lived and died like a prophet, for President Thomas S. Monson, whom we love and honor. We ask you to bless him, to bless the First Presidency of the Twelve, to bless us on this glorious Sabbath day in which we may remember Thee and Thy Son and honor Thee. Please help us to be humble and pure and teachable. Bless us with thy spirit today, wherever we may be. We plead with thee that thou would be with all the people of the earth to bless them with the light and the blessings of the gospel. In the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we so love and honor. Amen. It will now be our joy and privilege to hear from our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson. He will be followed by President Rosalind Nelson, President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following President Nelson's remarks, the choir will sing on this day of joy and gladness. We will then hear from Elder Peter F. Merce of the Seventy. He will be followed by Sister Linda S. Reeves, Second Counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. President Monson. My beloved brothers and sisters, both here in the Conference Center and throughout the world, how grateful am I for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you this morning. Fifty-two years ago, in July of 1964, I had an assignment in New York City during the time the World's Fair was hosted there. Early one morning, I visited the Mormon Pavilion at the fair. I arrived just prior to a showing of the Church's film Man's Search for Happiness, a portrayal of the plan of salvation, which has since become a church classic. I sat next to a young man who was perhaps 35 years of age. We spoke briefly. He was not a member of our church. Then the lights dimmed and the show commenced. We listened to the voice of the narrator as he posed the poignant and universal questions where did I come from? Why am I here? Where do I go when I leave this life? All ears strained to hear the answers, and all eyes were fixed on the images portrayed. A description of our pre moral life was given, along with an explanation of our purpose on Earth. We witnessed a touching depiction of the passing from this life of an elderly grandfather and of his glorious reunion with loved ones who had preceded him to the spirit world. At the conclusion of this beautiful portrayal of our Heavenly Father's plan for us, the crowd silently filed out, many visibly touched by the message of the film. The young visitor next to me did not arise. I asked if he had enjoyed the presentation. His emphasis and emphatic response was, this is the truth. Our Father's plan for happiness and our salvation is shared by our missionaries throughout the world. Not all who hear this divine message accept and endure and embrace it. 
However, men and women everywhere, just like my young friend at the New York World's Fair, recognize this truth, and they plant their feet on the path that will lead them safely home. Their lives are forever changed. Essential to the plan is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Without His atoning sacrifice, all would be lost. It's not enough, however, merely to believe in Him and in mission. We need to work and learn and search and pray, repent and improve. We need to know God's laws and live them. We need to receive His saving ordinances. Only by so doing will we attain true eternal happiness. We're blessed to have the truth. We have the mandate to share the truth. Let us live the truth that we might merit all that the Father has for us. He does nothing save it be for our benefit. He has told us, I quote, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man, close quote. From the depths of my soul and in all humility, I testify of the great gift which is our Father's plan for us, it is the one perfect plan to peace and happiness, both here and in the world to come. My brothers and sisters, I leave with you my love and my blessing. As I close, I do so in the name of our Savior and Redeemer, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, President Monson. We love and sustain you. My dear brothers and sisters, today I would like to discuss a principle that is key to our spiritual survival. It is a principle that will only become more important as the tragedies and travesties around us increase. These are the latter days, so none of us should be surprised when we see prophecy fulfilled a host of prophets, including Isaiah, Paul, Nephi, and Mormon, foresaw the, that perilous times would come, that in our day the whole world would be in commotion, that men would be lovers of their own selves without natural affection, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, and that many would become servants of Satan who uphold the adversary's work. Indeed, you and I wrestle against the rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. As conflicts between nations escalate, as cowardly terrorists prey on the innocent, and as corruption in everything from business to government becomes increasingly commonplace, what can help us? What can help each of us with our personal struggles and with the rigorous challenge of living in these latter days, the prophet Lehi taught a principle for spiritual survivor. First, consider his circumstances. He had been persecuted for preaching truth in Jerusalem and had been commanded by the Lord to leave his possessions and flee with his family into the wilderness. They had lived in a tent, survived on what food could be found on the way to an unknown destination. And he had watched two of his sons, Laman and Lemuel, rebel against the teachings of the Lord and attack their brothers, Nephi and Sam. Clearly, Lehi knew opposition, anxiety, heartache, pain, disappointment, and sorrow. Yet he declared boldly and without reservation a principle as revealed by the Lord. Men are that they might have joy. Imagine, of all the words he could have used to describe the nature and purpose of our lives here in mortality, he chose the word joy. Life is filled with detours and dead ends, trials and challenges of every kind. 
Each of us has likely had times when distress, anguish, and despair almost consumed us. Yet, we are here to have joy? Yes. The answer is a resounding yes. But how is that possible? And what must we do to claim the joy that Heavenly Father has in store for us? Eliza R. Snow, second general president of the Relief Society, offered a riveting answer. Because of Missouri's infamous extermination order, issued at the onset of the grueling winter of 1838, she and other saints were forced to flee the state that very winter. One evening, Eliza's family spent the night in a small log cabin used by refugee saints. Much of the chinking between the logs had been extracted and burned for file, firewood by those who preceded them, so there were holes between the logs large enough for a cat to crawl through. It was bitter cold. Their food was frozen solid. That night, some 80 people huddled inside that small cabin only 20 feet square. Most sat or stood all night trying to keep warm. Outside, a group of men spent the night gathered around a roaring fire, with some singing songs and others roasting frozen potatoes. Eliza recorded, not a complaint was heard. All were cheerful, and judging from the appearances, strangers would have taken us to be pleasure excursionists rather than a band of gubernatorial exiles. Eliza's report of that exhausting, bone-chilling evening was strikingly optimistic. She declared, quote, that was a very merry night. None but saints can be happy under every circumstance." Close quote. That's it. Saints can be happy under every circumstance. We can feel joy even while having a bad day, a bad week, or even a bad year. My dear brothers and sisters, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. When the focus of our lives is on God's plan of salvation that President Monson's just taught us, and Jesus' gospel, we can feel joy regardless of what is happening or not happening in our lives. Joy comes from and because of Him. He is the source of all joy. We feel it at Christmas time when we sing joy to the world, the Lord is come. And we can feel it all year round. For Latter-day Saints, Jesus Christ is joy. That is why our missionaries leave their homes to preach his gospel. Their goal is not to increase the number of church members. Rather, our missionaries teach and baptize to bring joy to the people of the world. Just as the Savior offers peace that passeth all understanding, he also offers an intensity, depth, and breadth of joy that defy human logic or mortal comprehension. For example, it doesn't seem possible to feel joy when your child suffers with an incurable illness, or when you lose your job, or when your spouse betrays you. Yet that is precisely the joy the Savior offers. His joy is constant, assuring us that our affliction shall be but a small moment and be consecrated to our gain. How then can we claim that joy? We can start by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, in every thought. We can give thanks for him in our prayers and by keeping covenants we've made with him and our Heavenly Father. As our Savior becomes more and more real to us, and as we plead for his joy to be given to us, our joy will increase. 
Joy is powerful, and focusing on joy brings God's power into our lives. As in all things, Jesus Christ is our ultimate exemplar, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Think of that. In order for him to endure the most excruciating experience ever endured on earth, our Savior focused on joy. And what was the joy that was set before him? Surely it included the joy of cleansing, healing, and strengthening us. The power of the joy of paying for the sins of all who would repent the joy of making it possible for you and me to return home clean and worthy to live with our heavenly parents and families. If we focus on the joy that will come to us or to those we love, what can we endure that presently seems overwhelming, painful, scary, unfair, or simply impossible? One father in a spiritually precarious situation focused on the joy of finally being clean and right with the Lord, the joy of being freed from guilt and shame, and the joy of having peace of mind. That focus gave him the courage to confess to his wife and bishop about his problem with pornography and his uh, subsequent infidelity. He is now doing everything his bishop counsels him to do, striving with all his heart to regain the trust of his dear wife. A young woman focused on the joy of staying sexually pure to help her endure the mocking of friends as she walked away from a popular and provocative but spiritually dangerous situation. A man who frequently demeaned his wife and indulged in angry outbursts at his children, focused on the joy of being worthy to have the Holy Ghost as his constant companion. That focus motivated him to put off the natural man to which he had too often succumbed and make needed changes. A dear colleague recently told me of his past two decades of heavy trials. He said, I have learned to suffer with joy. My suffering was swallowed up in the joy of Christ. <laughs> what will you and I be able to endure as we focus on the joy that is set before us? What repenting will then be possible? What weakness will become a strength? What chastening will become a blessing? What disappointments even tragedies, will turn to our good? And what challenging service to the Lord will we be able to give? As we diligently focus on the Savior and then follow his pattern of focusing on joy, we need to avoid those things that can interrupt our joy. Remember Korahor, the Antichrist? Spewing falsehoods about the Savior, Korahor went from place to place until he was brought before a high priest who asked him, Why do you go about perverting the ways of the Lord? Why do you teach this people that there shall be no Christ to interrupt their rejoicings? Anything that opposes Christ or his doctrine will interrupt our joy. That includes the philosophies of men so abundant online and in the blogosphere, which do exactly what Korahor did. If we look to the world and follow its formulas for happiness, we will never know joy. The unrighteous may experience any number of emotions and sensations, but they will never experience joy. Joy is a gift for the faithful. It is the gift that comes from intentionally trying to live a righteous life as taught by Jesus Christ. He taught us how to have joy. When we choose Heavenly Father to be our God and when we can feel the Savior's atonement working in our lives, we will be filled with joy. 
every time we nurture our spouse and guide our children, every time we forgive someone or ask for their forgiveness, we can feel joy. Every day that you and I choose to live celestial laws, every day that we keep our covenants and help others to do the same, joy will be ours. Heed these words of the psalmist. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. In his presence is fullness of joy. As this principle is embedded in our hearts, each and every day can be a day of joy and gladness. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you to the wonderful Tabernacle Choir. This truly is a day of joy and gladness. One of my earliest memories is of sacrament meetings held in our home in Warrnambool, Australia. Between 10 and 15 people attended our branch and my father, one of three priesthood holders, regularly had the opportunity to bless the sacrament. I remember the feelings I had as he humbly and carefully read the words of the sacrament prayers. Often his voice trembled as he felt the spirit. He sometimes had to pause to control his emotions before completing the prayer. As a five-year-old, I could not understand the full meaning of what was being said or done. However, I knew something special was occurring. I could feel the 
calm and reassuring influence of the Holy Ghost as my father contemplated the Saviour's love for us. The Saviour taught, this shall ye always do to those who repent and are baptised in my name. And ye shall do it in remembrance of my blood, which I have shed for you, that ye may witness unto the Father that ye do always remember me. And if ye do always remember me, ye shall have my spirit to be with you. I invite all of us to consider five ways to increase the impact and power of our regular participation in the sacred ordinance of the sacrament, an ordinance that can help us become holy. First, prepare in advance. We can begin our preparation for sacrament well before sacrament meeting begins. Saturday may be a good time to contemplate our spiritual progress and preparation. Mortality is an essential gift in our journey to become like our Heavenly Father. Of necessity, it includes trials and challenges that provide opportunities for us to change and grow. King Benjamin taught that the natural man is an enemy to God and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ Christ the Lord. Participation in the sacrament ordinance provides an opportunity to more fully yield our hearts and souls to God. In our preparation, our hearts become broken as we express gratitude for Christ's atonement, repent of our mistakes and shortcomings, and ask for the Father's help in our continuing journey to become more like him. We can then look forward to the opportunity the sacrament provides to remember his sacrifice and renew our commitments to all the covenants we have made. Second, arrive early. Our sacrament experience can be enhanced when we arrive well before the meeting and ponder as the prelude music is played. President Boyd K. Packer taught, prelude music reverently played is nourishment for the spirit. It invites inspiration. This is, this is not a time, President Russell M. Nelson explained, for conversation or transmission of messages, but a period of prayerful meditation as leaders and members prepare spiritually for the sacrament. Third, sing and learn from the words of the sacrament hymn. The sacrament hymn is an especially important part of our sacrament experience. Music elevates our thoughts and feelings. The sacrament hymn has even greater influence when we focus on the words and the powerful doctrine taught. We learn much from words such as, bruised, broken, torn for us. Let us remember and be sure our hearts and hands are clean and pure and where justice, love and mercy meet in harmony divine. As we sing a hymn in preparation to partake of the emblems, the words can become part of our covenant commitment. Consider, for example, we love thee, Lord, our hearts are full, we'll walk thy chosen way. Fourth, spiritually participate in the sacrament prayers. Instead of tuning out the familiar words of the sacrament prayers, we can learn much and feel even more as we participate spiritually by considering the commitments and associated blessings included in these sacred prayers. The bread and water are blessed and sanctified for our souls. They remind us of the sacrifice of the Saviour and that he can help us to become holy. The prayers explain that we partake of the bread in remembrance of the body of the Son, which he gave as a ransom to qualify all for resurrection and we drink of the water in remembrance of the blood of the Son, which he freely shed so that we might be redeemed on condition of repentance. The prayers introduce the covenants with the phrase that they are willing. This phrase has so much potential power for us. Are we willing to serve and participate? Are we willing to change? Are we willing to address our weaknesses are we willing to reach out and bless others? 
Are we willing to trust the Saviour? As the promises are stated and as we partake, we confirm in our hearts that we are willing to take upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ, strive to keep all of his commandments and always remember him. The prayer concludes with a sublime invitation and promise that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Paul wrote, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and temperance. Beautiful blessings and gifts are available to us as we keep our covenants. Fifth, ponder and remember him as the sacrament emblems are passed. The reverent moments as priesthood holders pass the sacrament can become sacred to us. As the bread is passed, we may contemplate that in the ultimate act of love for us, the Saviour took upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people. We may remember the glorious blessings of the resurrection that shall come to all, both bond and free, both male and female, both the wicked and the righteous, and even there shall not so much as a hair of the heads be lost, but everything shall be restored to its perfect frame. As the water is passed, we may remember the plea of the Saviour. Behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. Which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. We remember that he took upon him our infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succour his people according to our infirmities. As we consider our sacrament experience, we might ask ourselves, what will I do this week to better prepare for the sacrament? Could I contribute more to the reverence and revelation that can accompany the beginning of sacrament meeting? What doctrine was taught in the sacrament hymn? What did I hear and feel as I listened to the sacrament prayers? What did I think about as the sacrament was passed? Elder David A. Bednar taught, the ordinance of the sacrament is a holy and repeated invitation to repent sincerely and to be renewed spiritually. The act of partaking of the sacrament in and of itself does not remit sins, but as we prepare conscientiously and participate in this holy ordinance with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then the promise is that we may always have the spirit of the Lord to be with us. And by the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost as our constant companion, we can always retain a remission of our sins. I testify of the multitude of blessings available to us as we increase our preparation and spiritual participation in the ordinance of the sacrament. I further testify that these blessings are available to us because of the love of our Father in heaven and the infinite atoning sacrifice of his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. In his sacred name, even Jesus Christ, amen. amen. A few months before President Boyd K. Packer passed away, general priests and auxiliary leaders had the precious opportunity of having him speak to us. I've not been able to quit thinking about what he said. He shared that he had searched backwards throughout his lifetime looking for the evidence of the sins that he had committed and sincerely repented of and could find no trace of them. Because of the atoning sacrifice of our beloved Savior and through repentance, his sins were completely gone as if they had never happened. President Packer then charged us as leaders that day to testify that this is true for each one of us that sincerely repents. I'm aware of a man who was involved in moral transgressions several years ago. 
For some time, this man felt too ashamed and too worried to approach his wife and his priesthood leaders. He wanted to fully repent, but actually expressed that he was willing to give up his own eternal salvation rather than put his spouse or children through the sorrow, shame, or other consequences that might be caused by his confession. When we have sinned, Satan often tries to convince us that the unselfish thing to do is to protect others from the devastation of the knowledge of our sins, including confessing to our bishop, who can bless our lives through his priesthood keys as a common judge in Israel. The truth, however, however is that the unselfish and Christ-like thing to do is to confess and repent. This is Heavenly Father's great plan of redemption. Finally, this dear man confessed to his faithful wife and his church leaders, expressing deep remorse. Though it was the most difficult thing he had ever done, feelings of relief, peace, gratitude, and love for our Savior, and a knowledge that the Lord was lifting his heavy burden and carrying him caused joy beyond expression, regardless of the outcome and his future. He had been certain that his wife and children would be devastated, and they were, and that there would be a disciplinary action and release from his calling, and there was. He was certain that his wife would be brokenhearted, hurt, and angry, and she was. And he was convinced she would leave taking the children with her, but she didn't. Sometimes serious transgression leads to divorce, and depending on circumstances, that might be necessary. But to this man's amazement, his wife embraced him and dedicated herself to helping him in any way that she could. Over time, she was able to fully forgive him. She had felt the healing power of the Savior's Atonement for her. Years later, this couple and their three children are strong and faithful. The husband and wife serve in the temple and have a wonderful, loving marriage. The depth of this man's testimony and his love and gratitude for the Savior are so evident in his life. When I served with my husband as he presided over a mission, we went to the airport to pick up a large group of missionaries one morning. One particular young man caught our eye. He seemed sad, weighed down, almost distraught. We watched him carefully that afternoon. By evening, this young man made a belated confession, and his leaders determined he needed to, to return home. Although we were very sad that he had been dishonest and had not repented before coming on his mission, on the way to the airport, we sincerely and lovingly praised him for having the courage to come forward, and we pledged to stay in close contact with him. This great young man was blessed to have wonderful parents, great priesthood leaders, and a supportive, loving ward. After a year of working hard to fully repent and partake of the Savior's atonement, he was able to return to our mission. It's difficult for me to describe the feelings of joy we felt as we picked up this young man from the airport. He was full of the Spirit, happy, confident before the Lord, and anxious to fulfill a faithful mission. He became an outstanding missionary, and later my husband and I had the privilege of attending his temple ceiling. By contrast, I'm aware of another missionary who, knowing her unconfessed sin from before her mission would surely cause her to be sent home early, made her own plan to work extra hard during her mission and confessed to the mission president just days before completing her mission. She lacked godly sorrow and tried to circumvent, circumvent the plan that our loving Savior has offered each one of us. During our mission, I once accompanied my husband when he went to, an intervie to interview a man for baptism. While my husband conducted the interview, I waited outside with the sister missionaries who had taught this man. 
When the interview was finished, my husband informed the missionaries that the man would be able to be baptized. This dear man wept and wept as he explained that he had been certain that the serious sins he had committed in his life would prevent him from being able to be baptized. I have seldom witnessed the joy and happiness of someone coming out of the darkness and into the light equal to what I witnessed that day. Elder D. Todd Christofferson testified, quote, with faith in our merciful Redeemer and His power, potential despair turns to hope. One's very heart and desires change, and the once appealing sin becomes increasingly abhorrent. Whatever the cost of repentance, it is swallowed up in the joy of forgiveness." Unquote. These experiences remind me of Enos in the Book of Mormon, who cried unto the Lord in mighty prayer, then heard a voice saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee. And I, Enos, knew that God could not lie. Wherefore, my guilt was swept away, and I said, Lord, how is it done? And he said unto me, Because of thy faith in Christ, go to, thy faith hath made thee whole." Unquote. In preparing this talk, I wanted to get a feeling for how my grandchildren, our grandchildren, understand repentance and how they feel about the Savior. So I asked our children to ask them the following questions. I was touched by our grandchildren's responses. What is repentance? When you hit someone, you can say sorry and help them up. How do you feel when you repent? You can feel him. You can feel his warmness, and the bad feeling goes away. How do you feel about Jesus and Heavenly Father when you repent? I feel that Jesus feels it was worth it to do the atonement, and he's happy that we can live with him again. Why do Jesus and Heavenly Father want me to repent? In the words of my teenage grandchild, quote, because they love me, in order to progress and become like them, I need to repent. I also want the Spirit to be with me, so I need to repent daily to have his wonderful companionship. I will never be able to thank them enough, end quote. When four-year-old Brinley heard these questions, she said, I don't know, Daddy. You teach me. In a past general conference, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland declared, however late you think you are, however many chances you think you have missed, however many mistakes you feel you have made, or however far from home and family and God, you feel you have traveled, I testify that you have not traveled beyond the reach of divine love. It is not possible for you to sink lower than the infinite light of Christ's atonement shines. Oh, how I want each of my children, grandchildren, and each of you, my brothers and sisters, to feel the joy and closeness to Heavenly Father and to our Savior as we daily repent of our sins and weaknesses. Each accountable child of Heavenly Father needs repentance. Consider what sins we need to repent of. What is holding us back? In what ways do we need to improve? I know, as President Packer experienced and testified, that when we sincerely repent of our sins, they are truly gone without a trace. I have personally felt the love, the joy, the relief and confidence before the Lord as I have sincerely repented. To me, the greatest miracles in life are not the parting of the Red Sea, the moving of mountains, or even the healing of the body. The greatest miracle happens when we humbly approach our Father in Heaven in prayer fervently plead to be forgiven, and then are cleansed of those sins through the atoning sacrifice of our Savior. 
In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, on a signal from the conductor, the congregation will stand and join the choir and singing, I am a child of God. We will then be pleased to hear from Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Bishop Dean M. Davis of the presiding bishopric. Elder Lynn G. Robbins of the Presidency of the Seventy will then address us. After his remarks, the choir will sing, My Heavenly Father Loves Me. This is the 186th semi-annual general conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Several years ago, my family and I visited the Holy Land. One of my vivid memories from our trip was a visit to the Upper Room in Jerusalem, the traditional site of the Last Supper. As we stood in that place, I read to them John 17, where Jesus pleads with his Father for his disciples. I pray for them that they may be one as we are. Neither pray I for these alone, 
but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us. I was deeply moved while reading these words and found myself praying in that sacred place that I could ever be one with my family and with my Heavenly Father and with His Son. Our precious relationships with families, friends, the Lord, and His restored Church are among the things that matter most in life. Because these relationships are so important, they should be cherished, protected, and nurtured. One of the most heart-wrenching stories in the scriptures occurred when many of the Lord's disciples found it hard to accept His teachings and doctrine, and they went back and walked no, lo no longer with Him. As these disciples left, Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Will ye also go away? Peter responded, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In that moment, when others focused on what they could not accept, the apostles chose to focus on what they did believe and know. And as a result, they remained with Christ. Later, on the day of Pentecost, the Twelve received the gift of the Holy Ghost. They became bold in their witness of Christ and began to understand more fully Jesus' teachings. Today is no different. For some, Christ's invitation to believe and remain continues to be hard or difficult to accept. Some disciples struggle to understand a specific church policy or teaching. Others find concerns in our history or in the imperfections of some members and leaders, past and present. Still others find it difficult to live a religion that requires so much. Finally, some have become weary in well-doing. For these and other reasons, some Church members vacillate in their faith, wondering if perhaps they should follow those who went back and walked no more with Jesus. If any one of you is faltering in your faith, I ask you the same question that Peter asked. To whom shall you go? If you choose to become inactive or to leave the restored Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where will you go? What will you do? The decision to walk no more with the Church members and the Lord's chosen leaders will have a long-term impact that cannot always be seen right now. There may be some doctrine, some policy, some bit of history that puts you at odds with your faith, and you may feel that the one, only way to resolve that inner turmoil right now is to walk no more with the saints. If you live as long as I have, you will come to know that things have a way of resolving themselves. An inspired insight or revelation may shed new in, in light and insight on an issue. Remember, the restoration is not an event, but it continues to unfold. Never abandon the great truths revealed through the Prophet Joseph Smith. Never stop reading, pondering, and applying the doctrine of Christ contained in the Book of Mormon. Never fail to give equal time to the Lord through honest attempts to understand what the Lord has revealed. As my dear friend and former colleague Elder Neil A. Maxwell once said, we must not assume that just because something is unexplainable by us, it is unexplainable. So before you make that 
spiritually perilous choice to leave, I encourage you to stop and think carefully before giving up what it was that brought you to your testimony of the restored Church of Jesus Christ in the first place. Stop and think about what you have felt here and why you felt it. Think about the times when the Holy Ghost has borne witness to you of eternal truth. Where will you go to find others who share your beliefs in, in personal, loving, heavenly parents who teach us how to return to their eternal presence? Where will you go to be taught about a Savior who is your best friend and who suffered not only for your sins but who also suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind? so that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities, including, I believe, the infirmity of loss of faith. Where will you go to learn more about Heavenly Father's plan for our eternal happiness and peace a plan that is filled with wondrous possibilities, teachings, and guidance for our mortal and eternal lives. Remember, the plan of salvation gives mortal life a, a meaning and purpose and direction. Where will you go to find a detailed, inspired Church organization, a structure through which you are taught, supported by men and women, who are deeply committed to serving the Lord by serving you and your family? Where will you go to find living prophets and apostles who are called by God to give you another resource for counsel, understanding, comfort, and inspiration for the challenges of the day? Well, where will you go to find people who live by prescribed set of values and standards that you share and want to pass along to your children and grandchildren? And where will you go to experience the joy that comes through the saving ordinances and covenants of the temple? Brothers and sisters, accepting and living the gospel of Christ can be challenging. It has always been thus, and it ever will be. Life can be like hikers ascending a steep and arduous trail. It is a natural and normal thing to occasionally stop on the path to catch our breath, to recalculate our bearings, and to reconsider our pace. Not everyone needs to pause on the path, but there is nothing wrong with doing so when your circumstances require. In fact, it can be a positive thing for those who take full advantage of the opportunity to refresh themselves with the living water of the gospel of Christ. The danger comes when someone chooses to wander away from the path that leads to the tree of life. Sometimes we can learn and study and know, and sometimes we have to believe, trust, and hope. In the end, each one of us must respond to the Savior's question, Will ye also go away? We all have to search for our own answer to that question. For some, the answer is easy. For others, it is difficult. I don't pretend to know why faith to believe comes easier for some than for others. I'm just so grateful to know that the answers are always there, and if we seek them, really seek with real intent and with full purpose of heart, prayerfully, we will eventually find answers to our questions as we continue on the gospel path. In my ministry, I have known those who have drifted and returned after their trial of faith. My sincere hope is that we will invite an increasing number of God's children to find and stay 
on the gospel path, so they too can partake of the fruit which is desirable above all other fruit. My heartfelt plea is that we will encourage, accept, understand, and love those who are struggling with their faith. We must never neglect any of our brothers and sisters. We are all at different places on the path, and we need to minister to one another accordingly. Just as we should open our arms in a spirit of welcoming a new converts, so should we embrace and support those who have questions and are faltering in their faith. Utilizing another familiar metaphor, I pray that anyone thinking to leave the old ship Zion, where God and Christ are at the helm, will pause and think carefully before you do. Please know that even though great storms of wind and waves beat upon the old ship, always remember the Savior is on board and is able to rebuke the storm with his command, peace, be still. Until then, we must not fear and we must have unwavering faith and know that even the wind and the sea obey him. Brothers and sisters, I promise you in the name of the Lord that he will never abandon his church and that he will never abandon any one of us. Remember Peter's response to the Savior's question and words, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I testify there is no other name given nor any other way nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ. I also testify that Jesus Christ has called apostles and prophets in our day and restored His Church with teachings and commandments as a refuge from the storm and wrath that will surely come unless the people of the world repent and return to Him. I further testify that the Lord inviteth them all to come unto Him and partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, all are alike unto God. Jesus is our Savior and Redeemer, and his restored gospel will lead us safely back to the presence of our heavenly parents. If we remain on the gospel path, and follow in his footsteps, to which I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. One of the most remarkable and tender experiences recorded in Holy Scripture is the account of the visit of the Savior to people in the Americas following His death and resurrection. The people had suffered a destruction so great that it caused the whole earth to become deformed. The record of those events relates that following the catastrophe, all the people wept continually, and in the midst of their deep grief, they hungered for healing, peace, and deliverance. When the Savior descended from heaven, the people twice fell at his feet. The first occurred after he pronounced with divine authority, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And behold, I am the light and the life of the world. He then invited those present to arise and come forth unto me, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. 
And when they had all gone forth and had witness for themselves, they did cry out with one accord, saying, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Most High God. And then for a second time, they did fall down at the feet of Jesus, but this time with purpose, for we learn that they did worship him. Earlier this year, I was on assignment visiting a stake in the Western United States. It was a normal Sunday, a normal meeting with normal members of the Church. I watched as people entered the chapel and reverently moved to available seats. Last second, muffled conversations echoed throughout the hall. Mothers and fathers tried, sometimes in vain, to quiet, energetic children, normal. But then, before the meeting began, words inspired of the Spirit came into my heart and mind. These members had not come just to fulfill a duty or listen to speakers. They had come for a far deeper and far more significant reason. They had come to worship. As the meeting progressed, I observed various members in the congregation. They had an almost heavenly expression, an attitude of reverence and peace. Something about them warmed my heart. The experience they were having that Sunday was something quite extraordinary. They were worshiping. They were experiencing heaven. I could see it in their countenances, and I rejoiced and worshiped with them. And as I did so, the Spirit spoke to my heart. And on that day, I learned something about myself, about God, and about the role of true worship in our lives. Latter-day Saints are exceptional when it comes to serving in Church callings, but sometimes we may go about our work routinely as though we are merely performing a job. Sometimes our attendance at meetings and service in the Kingdom may lack the holy element of worship, and without that we are missing an incomparable spiritual encounter with the infinite, one we are entitled to as children of a loving Heavenly Father. Far from being an accidental, happy occurrence, worship is essential and central to our spiritual life. It is something we should yearn for, seek out, and strive to experience. When we worship God, we approach Him with reverent love, humility, and adoration. We acknowledge and accept Him as our sovereign King, the Creator of the universe, our beloved and infinitely loving Father. We respect and revere Him. We submit ourselves to Him. We lift our hearts in mighty prayer, cherish His word, rejoice in His grace, and commit to follow Him with dedicated loyalty. Worshiping God is such an essential element in the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ that if we fail to receive Him in our hearts, we will seek for Him in vain in our councils, churches, and temples. True disciples are drawn to worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, calling upon the name of the Lord day and night. We can learn much about true worship by examining how others, people who perhaps were not so different from ourselves, encountered, behaved, and worshiped in the presence of the divine. In the first part of the 19th century, the Christian world had all but abandoned the idea that God still spoke to man. But in the spring of 1820, that changed forever when a humble farm boy entered a grove of trees and knelt to pray. From that day on, a stream of remarkable visions, revelations, and heavenly appearances have bathed the earth, endowing its inhabitants with precious knowledge regarding the nature and purpose of God and His relationship with man. Oliver Cowdery described those days as never to be forgotten. What joy, what wonder, what amazement! Oliver's words convey the first elements that accompany true worship of the divine, a sense of majestic awe and profound thanksgiving. Every day, but especially on the Sabbath day, we have the extraordinary opportunity to experience the wonder and awe of heaven and offer our praises to God for His blessed goodness and overwhelming mercy. This will lead us to hope. These are the first elements of worship. On the blessed day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit entered into the hearts and minds of the disciples of Christ, 
filling them with light and knowledge. Until that day, they were at times unsure of what they should do. Jerusalem had become a dangerous place for a follower of the Savior, and they must have wondered what would become of them. But when the Holy Spirit filled their hearts, doubt and reluctance vanished. Through the transcendent experience of true worship, the saints of God received heavenly light, knowledge, and a strength and testimony, and that led to faith. From that moment on, the apostles and saints acted with determined direction. With boldness, they preached Christ Jesus to all the world. When we worship in spirit, we invite light and truth into our souls, which strengthens our faith. These two are necessary elements of true worship. In the Book of Mormon, we learn that from the moment Alma the Younger was delivered from suffering the consequences of his own rebelliousness, he was never the same. He boldly traveled throughout all the land and among all the people, zealously striving to repair all the injuries which he had done to the Church. His constant worship of the Almighty God took the form of energetic discipleship. True worship transforms us into sincere and earnest disciples of our beloved Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. We change and become more like Him. We become more understanding and caring, more loving, more forgiving. We understand that it is impossible to say that we love God while at the same time hating, dismissing, or disregarding others around us. True worship leads to an unwavering determination to walk the path of discipleship, and that leads inevitably to charity. These two are necessary elements of worship. When I reflect back on what began as a normal Sunday morning in that normal meeting house in that normal stake, even today I am moved by that extraordinary spiritual experience that will forever bless my life. I learned that even if we are exceptional managers of our time, callings, and assignments, even if we check all the boxes on our list of the perfect individual, family, or leader, if we fail to worship our merciful deliverer, heavenly King, and glorious God, we are missing much of the joy and peace of the gospel. When we worship God, we acknowledge and receive Him with the same reverence as those ancient people of the Americas. We approach Him with incomprehensible feelings of wonder and awe. We marvel in gratitude at the goodness of God, and thus we acquire hope. We ponder God's word, and that fills our souls with light and truth. We comprehend spiritual vistas that can only be seen through the light of the Holy Ghost, and thus we acquire faith. As we worship, our souls are refined and we commit to walk in the footsteps of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. And from this resolve, we acquire charity. When we worship, our hearts are drawn out in praise to our blessed God, morning, noon, and night. We hallow Him and honor Him continually in our meeting houses, homes, temples, and in all our labors. When we worship, we open our hearts to the healing power of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. Our lives become the token and expression of our worship. My brothers and sisters, spiritual experiences have less to do with what is happening around us and everything to do with what is happening within our hearts. It is my witness that true worship will transform ordinary Church meetings into extraordinary spiritual feasts. It will enrich our lives, broaden our understanding, and strengthen our testimonies. For as we incline our hearts to God, like the ancient psalmist, we enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. We are thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Through sincere and heartfelt worship, we blossom and mature in hope, faith, and charity. And through that process, we gather heavenly light into our souls that infuses our lives with divine meaning, abiding peace, and everlasting joy. That is the blessing of worship in our lives. 
Of this I humbly testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In his mortal life, Jesus Christ was a loving judge, uncommonly wise and patient. He is known in the scriptures as the righteous judge, and his counsel to us is to also judge righteous judgment, and to put your trust in that spirit which leadeth to do good and to judge righteously. To help us judge as he does, he gave this counsel to the Nephite Twelve. Ye shall be judges of this people according to the judgment which I shall give unto you, which shall be just. Therefore, what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. We sometimes forget that when he gave the counsel to be as he is, it was in the context of how to judge righteously. A shameful example of unrighteous judgment comes from the parable of the lost sheep when the Pharisees and scribes ill-judged both the Savior and his dinner company, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them, oblivious to the fact that they were sinners themselves. Possessed of condemning hearts, the scribes and Pharisees never knew the joy of rescuing lost sheep. It was also the scribes and Pharisees who brought a woman taken in adultery to the Savior to see if he would judge her according to the law of Moses. You know the rest of the story, how he humbled them for their unrighteous judgment and how they were convicted by their own conscience and departed one by one. He then said to the woman, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on his name. The natural man and woman in each of us has a tendency to condemn others and to judge unrighteously or self-righteously. It even happened to James and John, two of the Savior's apostles. They were infuriated when the people of a Samaritan village treated the Savior disrespectfully. And when they saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Today's common judges should avoid any similar impulse to condemn like James and John did on that occasion. A righteous judge would respond to confessions with compassion and understanding. An erring youth, for example, should leave the bishop's office feeling the love of the Savior through the bishop and enveloped in the joy and the healing power of the atonement, never shamed or held in contempt. Otherwise, the bishop may unwittingly drive the lost sheep further into the wilderness. However, compassion doesn't nullify the need for discipline. The word discipline comes from the Latin word discere, to learn, or discipulus, learner, making a, di making a disciple, a student, and follower. To discipline the Lord's way is to lovingly and patient patiently teach. In the scriptures, the Lord often uses the word chasten when speaking of discipline. The word chasten comes from the Latin castus, meaning chaste or pure, and chasten to purify. In the world, it is an earthly judge that condemns a man and locks him in prison. In contrast, the Book of Mormon teaches us that when we willfully sin, we become our own judges and consign ourselves to spiritual prison. And ironically, the common judge in this case holds the keys that unlock the prison gates. For with the chastisement, I prepare a way for their deliverance out of all things, all things out of temptation. The proceedings of a righteous judge are merciful, loving, and redemptive, not condemning. Young Joseph Smith was disciplined with a four-year probation before obtaining the golden plates, quote, because you have not kept the commandments of the Lord, end quote. Later, when Joseph, Joseph lost the 116 manuscript pages, he was disciplined again. Though he was truly remorseful, the Lord still withdrew his privileges for a short season, because whom I love, I also chasten, that their sins may be forgiven. Joseph said, The angel was rejoiced when he gave me back the Urim and Thummim, and said that God was pleased with my faithfulness and humility, and loved me for my penitence and diligence in prayer. 
Because the Lord wanted to teach Joseph a heart-changing lesson, he required a heart-rending sacrifice of him, sacrifice being an essential part of discipline. In ancient days, sacrifice meant to make something or someone holy, linking it in an interdependent way to the definition of the word chasten, to purify. Likewise, in ancient Israel, forgiveness came through a sin or trespass offering or sacrifice. The sacrifice not only pointed to that great and last sacrifice, but helped engender a deeper sense of gratitude for the Savior's atonement. And an unwillingness to sacrifice as part of our penitence mocks or belittles his greater sacrifice for the same sin and trivializes his suffering, a callous sign of ingratitude. On the other hand, through the sweet irony of sacrifice, we actually gain something of eternal worth, his mercy and forgiveness, and eventually all that the Father hath. As part of the repentance process, sacrifice also acts as a healing balm to replace remorse of conscience with peace of conscience. Without sacrifice, a person may find it hard to forgive themselves because of a lingering consciousness of something withheld. While few of us will be called to be common judges, the principles of righteous judgment apply to all of us, especially to parents who have a daily opportunity to use these principles with their children. To effectively teach a child is the very essence of good parenting, and to lovingly discipline the very essence of being a righteous judge. President Joseph F. Smith taught, if children are defiant and difficult to control, be patient with them until you can conquer by love, and you can then mold their characters as you please. It is insightful that in teaching how to discipline, the prophets seem to always refer to Christ-like attributes. Doctrine and Covenants gives us this well-known advice on discipline. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile, reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and then showing forth afterwards an increase in love. This scripture teaches us to reprove when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, not when moved upon by anger. The Holy Ghost and anger are incompatible, because he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil, who is the father of contention, and he stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger. George Albert Smith taught that, quote, unkind things are not usually said under the inspiration of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is a spirit of kindness. It is a spirit of patience. It is a spirit of charity and love and forbearance and long-suffering. But if we have the spirit of fault-finding in a destructive manner, that never comes as a result of the companionship of the Spirit and is always harmful. Kindness is the power that God has given us to unlock hard hearts and subdue stubborn souls." Close quote. When the Savior visited the Nephites, he did something extraordinary with the children. And it came to pass that he did teach and minister unto the children of the multitude, and he did loose their tongues, and they did speak unto their fathers great and marvelous things. And they both saw and heard these children. Yea, even babes did open their mouths and utter marvelous things. Perhaps more than opening the mouths of babes, the Lord was opening the eyes and ears of their astonished parents. Those parents had been granted the extraordinary gift of a glimpse into eternity and beholding the true identity and premortal stature of their children. Would that not forever change the way parents saw and treated their children? I like this variation of a Goethe quote, the way you see a child is the way you treat them, and the way you treat them is what they will become. To remember a child's true identity is a gift of foresight that divinely inspires the vision of a righteous judge. President Thomas S. Monson has taught us, never let a problem to be solved 
become more important than a person to be loved. How very vital that principle is in becoming righteous judges, especially with our own children. There is only one way to judge righteous judgment as Jesus Christ does, and that is to be as he is. Therefore, what manner of men and women ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are indeed grateful for the, to the amazing Mormon Tabernacle Choir, their conductors and their organists for the beautiful music they have provided this morning. Our concluding speaker for this session will be President Henry B. Eyring, First Counselor in the First Presidency. Following President Eyring's remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, "Come." Ye thankful people, come. The benediction will then be offered by Brother Devin G. Durand, first counselor in the Sunday School General Presidency. President Eileen. My dear brothers and sisters who are spread across the world, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I am grateful that President Thomas S. Monson has asked me to speak in conference on this Sabbath day. I pray that the Holy Ghost will carry my words into your heart. Today I desire to speak about 
feelings of the heart. The one I will focus on is gratitude, particularly on the Sabbath day. We feel grateful for many things, a kindness from a stranger, a meal when we are hungry, a dry roof over our heads when storms arise, a broken bone that heals, and the hearty cry of a newborn baby. Many of us will remember feeling gratitude at such moments. For Latter-day Saints, the Sabbath is such a moment, actually a day of gratitude and love. The Lord instructed the saints in Jackson County, Missouri in 1831 that their prayers and thanks should be directed heavenward. The early saints were given a revelation about how to keep the Sabbath day and how to fast and pray. They and we were told by the Lord how to worship and give thanks on the Sabbath. As you can tell, what matters most is the love we feel for the givers of the gifts. Here are the Lord's words of how to give thanks and how to love on the Sabbath. Quote, I give unto them a commandment saying thus, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, mind, and strength, and in the name of Jesus Christ thou shalt serve him. Thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. Thou shalt offer a sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in righteousness, even that of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And then the Lord goes on to warn of danger should we fail to thank Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ as the giver, givers of the gifts. Quote, and in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments. Close quote. Many of you listening already find joy in the Sabbath as a day to remember and give thanks to God for blessings. You remember the familiar song, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings. Every doubt will fly and you will be singing as the days go by. I receive letters and visits from faithful Latter-day Saints who feel burdened with a load of care. Some are close to feeling that, at least for them, all is lost. I hope and pray that what I say about being grateful on the Sabbath will be helpful to make doubts fly and for singing to start in your hearts. One blessing for which we can be grateful is that we are there in that sacrament meeting at all, gathered with more than one or two of his disciples in his name. There are some at home unable to rise from their beds. There are some who would like to be where we are in the sacrament meeting, but are instead serving in hospitals and providing public safety or defending us at the risk of their own life in some desert or jungle. The fact that we are able to gather when even one other, with even one other saint and partake of the sacrament will help us begin to feel gratitude and love for God's kindness. Because of the prophet Joseph Smith and the restored gospel, another blessing we can count is that we have the opportunity to take the sacrament each week prepared, blessed, and passed by authorized servants of God. We can be grateful when the Holy Spirit confirms to us that the words of the sacrament prayer offered by those authorized priesthood holders are honored by our Heavenly Father. Of all the blessings we can count, the greatest by far is the feeling of forgiveness 
that comes as we partake of the sacrament. We feel greater love and appreciation for the Savior, whose infant sacrifice made possible our being cleansed from sin. As we partake of the bread and water, remember that he suffered for us. And when we feel gratitude for what he has done for us, we feel his love for us and our love for him. The blessing of love we receive will make it easier for us to keep the commandment to always remember him. You may even feel love and gratitude as I do for the Holy Ghost, who Heavenly Father has promised will always be with us as we remain faithful to the covenants we have made. We can count all those blessings every Sunday and feel grateful. The Sabbath is also a perfect time to remember the covenant we made at the waters of baptism to love and serve Heavenly Father's children. Fulfilling that promise on the Sabbath will include participating in a class or quorum with full purpose of heart to build faith and love among our brothers and sisters who are there with us. That promise will include cheerfully fulfilling our callings. I am grateful for the many Sundays I taught a deacon's quorum in Bountiful, Utah, as well as a Sunday school class in Idaho. And I even remember the times I served as an assistant to my wife in the nursery, where my main task was to hand out toys and pick them up. <laughs> it was years before I recognized through the Spirit that my simple service for the Lord mattered in the lives of Heavenly Father's children. To my surprise, some of them have remembered and thanked, thee, thanked me for my fledgling attempts to serve them for the Master on those Sabbath days. Just as we sometimes cannot see the results of our own service given on the Sabbath, we may not be able to see the cumulative effects of other servants of the Lord. But the Lord is building His kingdom quietly through His faithful and humble shepherds with little fanfare toward its glorious millennial future. It takes the Holy Spirit to see the growing grandeur. I grew up going to sacrament meetings in a tiny New Jersey branch with only a few members and one family, my own. Seventy-five years ago, I was baptized in Philadelphia in the only church-built chapel we could get to in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Yet, where there was one little branch in Princeton, New Jersey, there are now two large wards. And just days ago, thousands of young people performed in a celebration preceding the dedication of the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Temple. As a young man, I was called as a district missionary where we worshiped on Sundays in the only chapel in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Today there is a temple and four stakes. I left Albuquerque to go to school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There was one chapel and a district that stretched across much of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. I drove the hills of that beautiful country to sacrament meetings in tiny branches, most in small rented facilities or little remodeled homes. Now there is a sacred temple of God in Belmont, Massachusetts, and stakes that spread across the countryside. What I could not see clearly then was that the Lord was pouring out His Spirit on people in those little sacrament meetings. I could feel it, but I could not see the extent and the timing of the Lord's intentions to build and glorify His kingdom. A prophet, by revelation, saw and recorded what we can now see ourselves. Nephi said that our total numbers would not be great, but that the cumulative light 
would be a sight to see. And it came to pass, he said, that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God, and its numbers were few. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. In this dispensation, a similar prophetic description of our condition and the opportunities ahead is recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants. Ye have not as yet understood how great blessings the Father hath in his own hands and prepared for you. And he cannot bear all things now. Nevertheless, be of good cheer, for I will lead you along. The kingdom is yours, and the blessings thereof are yours, and the riches of eternity are yours. And he who receiveth all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious, and the things of this earth shall be added unto him even a hundredfold, yea, more. I have felt that transformation of growing gratitude for blessings and a love of God increasing across the church. It seems to accelerate among members of the church in times and places where there are trials of their faith, where they have to plead to God for help to even carry on. The times we will pass through will have in them hard trials, as they did for the people of Alma under the cruel Amulon, who put burdens on their backs too heavy for them to bear. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them in their afflictions, saying, Lift up your heads and be of good comfort, for I know of the covenant which ye have made unto me, and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage, and I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. And this will I do, that ye may stand as witnesses for me hereafter, and that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light, yea, the Lord did strengthen them, that they could bear up their burdens with ease, and they did submit cheerfully and with patience to the will of the Lord. You and I are witnesses that whenever we have kept our covenants with God, especially when it was hard. He has heard our prayers of thanks for what he has already done for us and has answered our prayer for strength to endure faithfully. And more than once, he has made us cheerful as well as strong. You might well be wondering what you could do to live and worship on this Sabbath day, to demonstrate your gratitude and to strengthen yourself and others for trials that lie ahead. You could begin today with a private and family prayer of thanks for all God has done for you. You could pray to know what the Lord would have you do to serve Him and others. Particularly, you could pray to have the Holy Ghost tell you of someone who is lonely or in need to whom the Lord would have you go. I can promise you, your prayers will be answered. And as you act on the answers you will receive, you will find joy in the Sabbath, and your heart will overflow with thankfulness. I testify that God the Father knows and loves you. The Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, atoned for your sins out of love for you. They, the Father and the Son, know your name as they knew the name of Prophet Joseph Smith when they appeared to him. I testify that this is the Church of Jesus Christ and that he will honor the covenants you make and renew with God. Your very nature will be changed to become more like the Savior. 
you will be fortified against the temptation and against feelings of doubt about the truth. You will find joy in the Sabbath. I so promise you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Our Heavenly Father, we love Thee. We are grateful for the inspired messages, the beautiful music of this session. We're grateful for what we've been taught and for what we've felt. We are grateful for a living prophet, our President Thomas S. Monson. We love him and those who stand at his side. 
May he feel of that love and support. We are grateful for thy son, Jesus Christ, for his life, his ministry, his message of joy, for his atoning sacrifice that blesses each of us in many ways. May we always remember him. And we pray in his name, even Jesus Christ, amen. This has been a broadcast of the 186th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.